Yeah, mm -hmm. good morning, everyone. Um, in this format, I, I don't see all of your pictures, so it's a, a little bit strange to be talking to myself, it seems. But, but I know you are there, and um, I'm looking forward to, to sharing this with you. Um, what I want to do is to um, uh, show those whom I, who have been an influence in my painting and my artwork, and uh, then I will show some of my slides and painting. And then uh, I will go on to um, try and talk with you about uh, possibilities of, or controversies, let's say, in the tradition of Shoto and in Sumie. And so maybe I'll be talking about that as I go along. Um, so, uh, I'm going to show, uh, some photos of Tokunaga, who is my teacher. What do I do now? Okay, share screen. And... Okay. Okay, here is Shoen Tokunaga Sensei, whom I met when I went to Japan, and I began studying uh, Shodo with her. I had studied some of uh, painting with a teacher in America, but when I went to Japan, I was looking for some art to follow, and uh, Tokunaga Sensei appeared in my life, and so I went with her. Uh, several years ago, um, we had a ceremony at Ensuji and she was invited and she painted for us at Ensuji. And as you can see, you, you, she uses a very large brush and her way is quite a uh, little bit wild, let me say, or unusual in how she paints. But uh, she's very exciting to watch and I've got a small video I'm going to show you also. So this is uh, something that she painted for us <clears throat> at Ensuji Temple at that ceremony that we had. So several years ago, uh, Celinda, I think you were there. Uh, I think you came to Evergreen and I organized a meeting between Tokunaga Sensei on the right and Fumiko, whom you recognize, the back view of her at a um, convocation at, at Evergreen, and both of them painted. And here we have Fumiko painting for the audience with very, very different styles. Of course, you saw Tokunaga's work, which is wild and, and big and unusual, and Fumiko, who paints in a very you know smaller brush style and paints much more recognizable subjects so um, <clears throat> I want to show you a little video then of Tokunaga painting at this particular event.
I think I want to show this again because I, I would like to speak through it now, or at least to just examine it a little bit in terms of uh, how Tokunaga Sensei is painting. Uh, you can see these probably are ways in which we would never do in in Sumie. And, uh, you know, she has loaded up the brush with ink and you can see how the it splits and uh, she drags it through the paper right on the very the heel of the brush. She is painting the character for life. And you can see in, in how the brush separates. Um, it's a kind of an exhaustion of the brush that takes place when it splits off like that. She might have painted this later in the demonstration because the brush gets very exhausted from uh, the amount of ink that it has to carry. So she lays it with this very, uh, you know, right on the heel of the brush. And then you can see how it splits off and she drives it forward then so that she gets a single stroke out of that finish. Now, where do I share screen? And then we come back to here, right? Okay. Uh, please, please interrupt any time if you have any questions so that we can have some dialogue here and, um, you know, we can talk together. So now I want to show you uh, some of the people who influenced me in my painting or even in my uh, brush painting style. So Franz Klein is one of those painters. He, uh, you probably recognize him. He was a member of the New York School of Painting and he did study calligraphy, Japanese calligraphy, and then he brought it into uh, this particular style and which is sort of calligraphy and sort of not, but a very exciting kind of um, composition. Here's another one of his paintings. Um, I don't know what kind of brush or whether he used some kind of flat brush to make a fairly square kind of line. It doesn't look like a brushed line. It looks like he used some other kind of tool uh, to create this particular pattern. But we can see uh, some kinds of calligraphy in here. You know, th this looks like a, a calligraphic piece and uh, maybe over here also. But um, also the dynamic is very powerful. And so as I'm very influenced by Franz Klein. Also by Robert Motherwell, uh, also, in the New York School. Motherwell, although Motherwell also was in California, <clears throat> Motherwell um, also studied Japanese calligraphy and then brought about his own style in the use of these, you know, big black powerful lines with some suggestion of calligraphy. And here's another one by Motherwell. So these uh, have influenced me. One more here is Richard Diebenkorn. Uh, Diebenkorn, um, I, I, I just like these. For, for some people, they seem very chaotic. And, and sorry, can I enlarge this like this? Yeah, they seem very chaotic and, and you know, have no particular uh, subject in mind except for the use of black and white and, and gray in his compositions. But I find them, you know, quite interesting and, and sorry. No, I wanted to go back here, sorry. I just wanted to go onto this and see if I can enlarge some of these, that's okay. So uh, any, anyway, um, at the same time that these are wild, they certainly have a balance to them and they work, but he is not trying to 
picture anything in particular when he is doing this work. Also, it might seem a little bit like clay, the, the painter, the Swiss painter clay in, in his paintings. So this is one of mine. It's just a takeoff from Robert Motherwell. And so um, I've been painting on underneath on a canvas and then laying down some other something on top. And it, um, you know, tells me um, something. I don't know. I don't know what I was attempting. I don't, you know, like Motherwell, I don't know that I'm necessarily looking at saying anything in particular. I'm looking at um, a, a very modernistic composition. I have a question for you, Edo. Yes. Um, those influences came before or after you started like um, pe brush painting? Probably before. Uh, okay. I've, yeah, I've always followed these painters and uh, I grew up in New York. And so uh, had you know museums all over the place and uh, as a child the Brooklyn Museum was up the street from where I lived and so we were going into museums constantly as a child so uh, I think that I, I was influenced by them much before maybe came to Robert Motherwell a little bit later but Franz Klein I always appreciated his work so this is another one um, by me this is not such a good color representation, but I've also been painting in uh, oils. And so the colors in this are not particularly clear, but what I appreciate is the offsetting of the composition with the um, large space, you know, somewhere without anything in it. And so uh, that is maybe the, um, you know, that, that you learn in Japanese painting and in Shodo that the white space needs to be there, the open space. And the same in this one, also the color isn't represented very well, but uh, this is also an oil painting. And once again, there's this open space here, the offsetting, the um, moving the subject out of the center Okay, now to coming into uh, brush painting. So this is part of the year of the dragon. If I do like this, is it going to hold? If I Okay, this is the year of the dragon. So uh, there's, you know, a few um, things that are going on here. This area in here, uh, I know there are names for all these, but I never can remember them, where I dipped the paper in ink floating on water and then let it dry, and then I painted on top of it from there. Maybe Suminagashi? Yes, thank you. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> thank you. I, I just never remember. I just remember how to do it. And of You're course, <laughs> the fact that the moon appeared over here was just, you know, a happenstance. It just worked. And sometimes these kinds of things happen, and, and they're helpful to the painting. So... There's the, the dragon flying across the moon. Here is another one. It's not quite on the, yeah. Uh, I and my Zen master and his wife are all dragons. So dragons are a big subject and uh, I, I just find it fun to paint them in a you know more unusual style than we typically find. So here, uh, Zumi Nagashi, as you say, in the background, and then the painting over. So, you know, while this is representative of dragons, I'm really interested in abstraction, which we'll come to, and um, <clears throat> Just because, uh, you know, because of the painters I've followed, I really uh, enjoy abstraction. This is also a drag painted during the Year of the Dragon. 
And I call it dragon rising, dragon rising out of the water, but there's no dragon, of course, showing up. So, you know, the attempt here is the use of ink then and, and letting the ink say something by itself and appreciating the beauty of the ink because anybody who chooses to paint in sumi or paint in uh, even calligraphy, the smell of ink and the beauty of how it resolves on the paper is just so gorgeous. And so that's, um, uh, this was in an art show and it, it was one of the smaller paintings and it stood on a wall by itself because this is this is one of the more powerful ones in the Year of the Dragon series. And there's no dragon there. It's an imagined dragon coming up out of the water. I have a question. Sure. Uh, so how large are these? And they were all uh, painted on the floor, right? Yes, that's right. Oh, wow. Yes, yes. And this, this is the smaller one. This but one the big ones, small. how large are they? This one is quite small. This is about nine by 11. Oh, oh okay. Very small. The others are, you know, um, um, when framed are about uh, 16 by 20. Oh. But they're not so, you know, showing them in a slides like this, they seem enormous. But this one is about... Um, 10 by 14. Oh. And this was a part of, here you can see more of the ink here. So the question for me is, how does the ink resolve on the paper? And can I create excitement in the ink itself? Just want to go to. And this was part of, uh, I, I think, a uh, storm painting. This one also the same, but it's an abstraction. Can I do it like this? To want to, yeah. Thank you, Fletcher. Yeah, I have Fletcher working with me here to help me make sure that we are reasonably smooth. Yeah, I want to get a little smaller. There we go. Maybe does it better to show that way. So here, once again, uh, is a mixture of styles. Over on the left here, you can see this suminagashi and then painted over and uh, just some residues of inks in here that make, make it all uh, an abstracted painting and just allowing the ink to speak for itself. This too, one of the storm paintings. And this one, this was just water and brush up here um, and a painting, a, a, you know, a sense of clouds and water and storm. Once again here. So, you know, once again to say, I'm, I'm just allowing the, ink to be the energy itself, the energy of the painting. And, you know, sometimes you get lucky. I don't know how many it took to get to something that I said, okay, that's, that's okay. As you know, you paint and paint and paint and you get lucky on one of your paintings. So now I'm moving into a little bit more um, subject. This is a, a smiling Buddha, a sitting Buddha, uh, abstracted, of course. And this was just a piece of luck. I saw something on the top of the water and I dipped the, the ink in and this is what happened. And I saw this as the heart of the Buddha and the energy of the Buddha and a seated Buddha is what I saw in it. And so it's... Uh, just happened by luck. And, and right in here, you can see the center, like a, like a Dharma wheel, right in the center of this. And it looks shiny too. Yeah. Yeah. That's a masterpiece that I didn't paint. <laughs> 
it just happened. And so, uh, yeah. Here is uh, abstracted Kuan Yin, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, we say in Japanese. In Chinese, it's Kuan Yin, and it's an abstracted form. Here too is another abstracted Buddha. I call this the smiling Buddha. And it's, you know, in the shape of, uh, what do you call it? No, um, uh, pardon, what do you call a, well, it's uh, just abstracted. And um, it this particular style of shape here was abstracted and represented women in Buddha's painting very early on. And this uh, sort of hairpiece then sort of falling down over the uh, over the uh, circle. And here represents the hands in meditation. So this is, um, I've lost the original of this, but this is, is my Enso. I think it's the best Enso that I've painted, but I, I lost the original and we use it now as our logo at Olympia Zen Center. Um, so the attempt in the in the ENSO is you know, to keep the center piece uh, reasonably smooth and allow the outer piece to um, you know, let, let the brush to create um, an interesting form as it goes around. And then of course, these are accidentals in here that become very beautiful. Um, anytime we get accidentals, you know, we just are so lucky and it's just so wonderful to see them and exciting. So here is a calligraphy. This is Mempeki facing the wall, which is what we do in our form of meditation. And so this is, uh, you know, my, style it's a fairly wild style <clears throat> having learned from tokenaga sensei but i also studied when i went into zen training i studied with um another shoto master who was a very exacting and had a very perfectionist style and um so during training time in the mornings, then we would come into the room where we were all learning to paint. A uh, Zen teacher has to be able to do uh, calligraphy. And um, <clears throat> we had an old guy who was in the room with us and he was a visitor, but, but he would come regularly and paint with us. And so anytime I painted and I did something wrong, my Zen master would come in and he'd slap me and he'd say, don't do it that way, do it this way. So it was severe training after the freedom that I had with Tokunaga Sensei to learn a very tight style. But then when a phone call would come and Goto Roshi had to leave the room, the old guy would say, don't pay any attention to that tight style, paint freely, paint like this. And he would paint something that was, you know, dirty, dirty style is what we called it. And so uh, he freed me up. And I have to say that I learned a great deal in brushing and in, in that training with the very exacting style, which Tokunaga started with me off in the beginning, of course, and then moved very quickly into um, a, a much more free form. S something like this, you know, sort of combined dirty and free form, correct, save and help, this says. And so um, I really appreciate all of this dripping and this kind of thing. I just find it very exciting to allow and to think particularly because the correct save and help, uh, it had a, had a kind of a sub-meaning to it in this calligraphy. I also like the, you know, the free form paper, the torn style mounted then on another piece of paper. Like this piece, poem. Um, you know, a poem is a free form mostly and 
is speaking to of something very wide. So allow these to allow these drippings to occur in a, you know, a particular style, just a free form of the calligraphy is is what I appreciate doing. So this one, um, these are big. These are right behind me on the wall. You can see there in my house. Um, <clears throat> I was painting with, I don't know if you know Simon Kogan, who is the, um, he's a sculptor in Olympia. He's a, a Russian sculptor and pretty famous. And he wanted to learn about Sumi ink. So he came over to paint with me to learn about Sumi and we painted together. And so I painted these using a standing brush, uh, like a mop and um, painted. I didn't know what I was painting. I was just painting. And so it turned out to be a gateway, the gate to the mountain of the moon. And here's the moon over here. So um, this is kind of my style. Just, you can see Franz Klein in this, of course, with much more obvious brush strokes. So, yeah, leave that up for a minute. Let's see where I am in this. So, um, so I want to show you at Olympia Zen Center. This is a building called Gogowan, and it's a replica of Ryokan's hut where he lived. And uh, although I don't think I'm influenced by Ryokan's calligraphy, I'm certainly influenced by the fact that Ryokan was a calligrapher and a poet. And I, I do both of those. And so um, here is my painting of Gogowan, a night painting of Gogowan. And Gogowan has been a subject for many years and so I've painted not only the outside, but the inside. So this is an abstracted painting of inside Gogawan. And I love doing this kind of thing. Um, this is in acrylics. And it's, I mean, I can't say what it is, except the title is Inside Gogawan. There's, if you get close to it, you can see that there's a lot happening in beside, you know, in, in the in the paint itself, but um, it's one of those where you have to get really, really close and look and see. I have another, here is also inside Gogawan. Edo, is the black ink, ink um, Sumi ink or acrylic? This is acrylic. Okay, thank you. This is also inside Gogawan. I think I've got one more. And this is a, a, a Quan Yin that is difficult to see in this rice paper, this very, very special rice paper uh, holding the moon and this form of the, and the, the robe lines here and the robe flowing down. I also like this very, you know, unfinished painted border. So now I want to show you what I am working on because I'm interested in the question of how this ink can express those kinds of subjects that are not, um, how can I get this? There we go. That's better maybe. That are not what you would usually see in Sumi painting, sumi -e. So my brother died a couple of years ago and I am trying to paint the last eight hours of my brother's life. So taking uh, some kind of emotional subject like this is really what I like to, to do best. It's what I most enjoy. 
And the question, of course, is whether in the tradition of Sumi or in Shoto, we can take up difficult subjects. I mean, I have I was so upset with Guantanamo Bay and the torturing that took place in Guantanamo Bay years ago that I painted a whole bunch of on Guantanamo Bay paintings. And when I spoke with Tokunaga Sensei about this, she said, no, you cannot do that. You cannot do that with Sumi, Sumi A, and you cannot do that with Shodo, because that's not the tradition of Shodo. The tradition of Shodo and Sumie is to put beautiful things into the world and not to show suffering, but to show beauty. So I can't call this Shodo and I can't call it Sumie. I just can call it ink painting on paper because um, it, it's a very difficult subject and it's hard, you know, but that's the kind of uh, thing that I like to take up, that I want to take up because it's expressive, it's, you know, it's abstract expressionism. And, you know, whether it succeeds then, whether it can succeed, let me see what I have after this. Um, whether it can succeed uh, using the elements of Sumi and Shoto and, and paper, because we need the Japanese paper in order to allow the ink to uh, express itself. So, uh, you know, I, Franz Klein didn't do that. He painted with uh, uh, oils or maybe acrylic even. Um, so I could do that, but it doesn't resolve in quite the same way. But that's what I'm working on now. And I wanted to show something like that uh, just to be able to talk about this together after so that um, I know that some of you may be thinking about what other ways can I paint using ink and simia. So I'd be interested in, after I run through a few more slides to talk with you in pictures to see, to, you know, to have a discussion together about the limits of, of sumi and the possibilities of sumi. So I just wanted to show Rio Kansan so Ryokan San is the poet, priest poet, who uh, trained at Ensuji Temple, which is my home temple. And um, he was a great calligrapher, and this is one of his most famous. And this is Above the Heavens, Great Wind, which is considered to be his life motto. Um, I guess you can make of that what you will, what that means in his life just his aspirations in the face of great difficulties. He lived as a monk and a hermit, and he begged his entire life. He often paid with the calligraphy to be able to get some food or to get a haircut in the, at the end of winter or something like that. And um, <clears throat> so he's one of the great calligraphers of Japan. This is one of his most famous, Ichi Nisan, uh, somebody asked him a question about, you know, what is life? And he painted these. It's, it's just one, two, three. I saw this in person and I burst into tears when I saw it because it was one of the truly most beautiful, simple, stunning calligraphies I have ever seen. Uh, it, it's, it's sensationally exciting. So simple. And this next one, and you can see his style is so simple. Uh, he used a very long brush. Um, I don't know how many inches, but because it was so long, it was considered a dancing style because he had to hold, hold it so lightly above the paper. And then his other very famous painting is E. Uh, um, e. Rohan which is a practice uh, calligraphy that you do in your warm-ups. Equally beautiful and simple and exciting. This is also another one that he did that is very famous. <clears throat> it's painted on the top of, of a um, sake, 
bin, a sake uh, vat. And this wood uh, piece was there. And he said, oh, I think I need to paint something on that. So he, he painted um, Shin, here's Shin, Getsu, uh, uh, Rin. So Shin is life, uh, Shin is heart, mind. This is the moon and this is circle. And so it's one of his most famous paintings also. You could see that the crack in the, in the wood. So this is one of his longer calligraphies. I do not know what this means. The only thing I can read is Ryokan over here. I don't know what this says, but I wanted to show you his dancing style of the brush, which is very beautiful, uh, very extremely difficult to imitate. And, um, you know, just exquisite in, in its beauty and completion of stroke. As you can see, as you know, in, in Sumi, how you put the brush down and how you pick it up is critical. It's what you learn in the very beginning. And you can see the beauty of his lines here and in here, how he places the brush down and then picks it up. Very, very beautiful. And he has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of calligraphies. Poems that were brushed. Uh, and after he died, when he was uh, 73, I think he became ill. <clears throat> but prior to that, he had met a woman who was a nun. She was also a poet and she was 28 years old. They fell in love and they wrote love poems together. And uh, after he died, she went around. <laughs> Excuse me. She went around and collected his work for the rest of her life. And so that's how we have his work because of, of her uh, love of Ariel Kansan. <clears throat> Edo, we have a question. Yes. Um, someone is asking if the paper is color, colored or painted. Uh, no, it's, it's just paper. It's, it's not painted paper. It's just uh, the the shadow or the uh, I I photographed this out of a book, and it's just uh, just plain white paper. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So this is Ryokan San at Ensuji Temple. This is the meditation hall, and this life size statue of him sits outside the meditation hall. And then this is the last slide, and this is my teacher, Niho Roshi, Niho Tetsume Roshi, and this is Mrs. Niho, uh, his wife. And I'm here, and I was visiting last um, November, and uh, so I wanted to show them because um, Niho Roshi also uh, is a calligrapher, although he doesn't, he doesn't produce art so much, but if you need him to, he will certainly do it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So uh, I want to stop sharing. I want to see you now. And I would like to be able to have some conversation together. If I could, we could go into a mode where we can all see one another and I could see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. So, um, so what, what, what are your thoughts about this? Um, about the subject matter? Uh, I know that you know, some of you are, Christelle mentioned that some of you might be thinking about what you would, you know, expanding into uh, some other styles or painting in other styles. And I just wonder what you think about that. Um, yeah. Um, so. I, I think it's just fabulous. It's so expressive. And uh, your work is just so wonderful to look at. I, I have a question mm -hmm. about some of the paintings that you did. There was sort of a warmth um, introduced in color. It looks like yellow ochre or yeah. something that you brought in that, that sort of warmed the painting. And I ask because I really enjoy 
Um, in my Sumi mark making, I enjoy introducing some walnut ink, some some nice. walnut ink in the background in a big swash before I start painting. And I just really love the way it warms up the painting. And I noticed that you had a lot of warmth in several of yours. Yeah, I think I saw some of your work. Did, did, weren't you in the show when we had the Fumiko Memorial? Yes, but yeah. I don't remember what I had in it. <laughs> I know, but I remember I remember that uh, that paint that you used, um, you know, a kind of an almond color. Uh, and I don't remember it exactly, but I remember the use of that color ink when I was looking at the paintings. So, yeah, it's, it's I, I walnut, agree with you. natural natural walnut ink is just a lovely addition to Sumi I've found, and I've enjoyed yeah. experimenting with it. Yeah, very definitely. I think that's great. I think that's great. Yeah. But your work is lovely. Thank you for sharing it with us. Well, thank you. I, you know, I wish I were doing more of it and I'm trying to, uh, trying to do more. And I see Lois is here and um, I told Lois if she is teaching at all, I want to go and study with her because she is such a master. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah. One more question. Yes, Francis. Yeah. So is uh, Zen painting uh, with Sumi on the floor? Is uh, that what it is? Or you could paint on the floor or you could paint on the table. It doesn't matter. Oh, OK. Yeah. So so on the floor means you have that big, big brush. Right. And that's right. the only way you can, I guess, paint on the floor. Otherwise, if you do it vertically, I guess. There's a lot of dripping, right? Well, dripping is nice. Dripping's okay. Oh, okay. Uh, sometimes there are great paintings that have drips all over them, but it's a question that you don't have a table that's big enough for the, oh, the paper okay. and you want to be on top, you want to be right over the painting itself so you do it on the floor so that you're right on top of the where you are painting. Oh, okay, Otherwise, got it. If it's on a table, you have to lean into it, and it's uh, it's mm. difficult on your body as well as in the balance of of the painting as you you do it. Mm. Okay, thank you. Another uh, question. Oh. So I have a question about um, <clears throat> Alice about what you think about Zen painting. How is that different from other paintings? Is that a kind of mindset or is that kind of style or a form or you know you know what how do you define it so that it's different from other paintings well if i if i called it a zen painting i think it because of subject matter uh and not necessarily the ink itself or what you know painting on uh there are zen paintings on you know done by uh oils on canvas but it would be a question of subject matter that you were painting from some zen emptiness or uh something like that that was expressing a universality of some kind um, so more the, the other, yeah the other thing that you could say is that all the painting that we do is spiritual uh -huh. no matter what your subject matter is so in that sense you are executing a Zen mind when you are painting. So if you want to call it Zen painting, it's, you can call it that. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, I have a question, Nato. Yes, that's my <laughs> Yeah, I, I wondered if you uh, grind your ink most of the time. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, I do. So the reason that you always want to do that, if you were going to make it into a scroll, and you were to use liquid ink, you cannot make a scroll because the way the scroll is made that the paper is laid out on a, a, a form of some kind and it's dipped into almost hot boiling water so that the paper is completely flat and then it's lifted out of the water and allowed to dry and then it's you know mounted on the, on the scroll the ink will run all over the place if you use liquid ink. So you can't do it. You can't dip it in water. And so the uh, stick ink will re resolve in that way so that it will not, it, it, it's fixed on the paper. And it's also good for 800 years. If you use really good paper, the ink and the paper are 
800 years it will last. So you always want to paint on good paper and paint with stick ink. Because you're Thank never you. going to get a masterpiece. You know, they yeah. happen by mistake. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> they happen when you're not sure. thinking and you're just practicing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And I do have an ink machine, by the way. Uh, I don't know if you have ink machines, if anybody has an ink machine. Do you have ink machines? So an ink machine is a, because otherwise, if you're using a big brush, you'll spend three days just trying to get one brush load. So the machine is um, a, um, literally, I could run and get it, so I want to show you, but uh, it, 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 it's, a uh, you know, a stone with a little uh, arm that goes over into the stone and holds the ink on the stone, and then it spins around. It's a little motor that spins around and it makes ink for you. So you can make a lot of ink more quickly. So anybody, anybody have a machine? <laughs> I've never heard of it. I didn't you know machine. there was such a thing. <laughs> I'm gonna show you, hold on just a moment. So that's great. <laughs> Oh, I'm afraid I must go. Okay, thank you, Bob. Hi, Bob. Bye, Bob. Bye, Bob. Bye, Bob. Guys, wasn't it, Hi, Bob. Wasn't it interesting that she was advised never to paint angrily? Raise your hand if you've ever expressed yourself creatively angrily. Mm. Wasn't that an interesting Hi. thing? <laughs> Okay. This is an ink machine. And you plug it in. And Crystal, you can you spotlight her? Pardon me? Can I, I was just asking for you to be spotlighted so we can see it up close. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, how do we do that? Oh, they do that. You do that. Yeah. So you can see that there's a cup here and there's a little spout on it so that you can capture it after you make the ink. So you put it in and then up here on this arm, you put in an ink stick that you lock into this place here. So you lock it in, you have to screw it up because this is a fat. Can everybody see it? Because for some reason I cannot see the yes. videos. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes, oh. it's right. amazing. Okay. So you lock yeah, the ink stick in here Fascinating. You put water in the, in the tray and you uh, lean it down and then it spins. And then after, you know, it gets as black as you want, then you just lift up the arm and you pour the ink into a, you know, a, a, a you know, a capturing place, a, a jar of some kind where you're going to save your ink. And you can do, uh, you know, you can get a lot of ink in a short period of time. But if you're doing sumi, you know, you don't need a lot of ink if you're, you know, painting uh, the, the typical kinds of sumi. This is for big brush kind of stuff or for a lot of work. But on the other hand, um, I make ink and I keep it in my refrigerator in a jar. And so I can keep it for a long period of time. And... Uh, just make ink available. So it's a machine. You might try maybe of a Japan town, you could order one or someplace. You could probably buy one online uh, somewhere. But yeah. did you buy that in Japan? Yeah. Yes, I did. Actually, I think Tokunaga Sensei gave it to me, is what I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's what I remember. But oh. there's no way that I could paint with the big brush by having to, you know, go like this yeah. so and uh my friend who is the sculptor now he borrows this so this machine goes around to various neighborhoods 
for people borrowing it in order to uh, you know, in order to make a lot of ink so that they have it. Yeah. So is Simon Kogan going to become a Sumi painter now? <laughs> he has been doing some fantastic painting with Sumi. Well, he's such a fabulous artist. I can only imagine what he's doing with Sumi. Yeah, it, it's just beautiful stuff. Um, you might see some of it on his website, Simon Kogan, K-O-G-A-N dot org. I think it's dot org. And uh, so, yeah, you'll see some of his work. And I, I, you know, you just get so jealous. He's so fantastic and, um, you know, is, is able to, to use it so beautifully immediately. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, so that's, that's, um, there you have it. And let me see what company makes this. Uh, I can't read it. So um, I, I can't read the name. I can take a photograph and send it to you if you want in the Japanese, but I can't read the name of, of that. Yes, I, I can publish it in the, the newsletter for next okay. month. If you I, will, I will photograph the Japanese and you can, uh, you know, print it and publish it. Thank you. Where you might be able to find an um, ink machine. <laughs> yeah. Any, well, any other questions? Hey, no. Yes. Good. Hey, no. hey, everybody. Um, this is Celinda. This is uh, Celinda. Yeah, but I'd like to be able to see everybody again. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Give me. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Okay. Celinda. So yeah. There I, I liked what you said about how the paper, the Japanese paper allows the ink to express itself. Yes. Um, I'm just fascinated by how the different types of Japanese paper bring out different qualities in the ink. Yes. I wonder, do you have favorites, a favorite of, from among the Japanese paper or yeah, you just I go just with don't... what you have? No, I don't know what they're called, but when I go to Japan, oh. I buy paper. I don't yeah, think you okay. get really, really good paper here. And mm -hmm. if you go to a paper store in Japan, it's like going into a fabric store. Yeah. <laughs> reams yeah. and reams and shelves <laughs> and shelves of different papers mm -hmm. that you just get so excited. Um, mm -hmm. You just don't know what to pick. It's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So I honestly don't know the names of the paper. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, you know... Maybe one person should go to Japan and buy a batch of paper and share it all around for everybody. Mm -hmm. not everybody can go. There we go. A new adventure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't think that we get good paper here. Uh, even yeah. buying online, I don't think that we can get really, really good paper. And right. so, uh, that's, so that's one of the things I do when I go to Japan is I buy paper. And of course. Eat. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And um, one of the I reasons found the I found yeah. the machine. Oh, you I did. I found the ink. It was. It's on Amazon. Oh, and it looks like yours. It's oh, good. Two hundred and thirty-nine dollars and fifty-eight cents. That's about it's right. Called Ink Maker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so you only need a couple to share around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, just buy. You know, have uh, buy rights in one of the machines together, and. It makes enough, you put it in a jar and you must keep it in the refrigerator because it will get rancid if you don't. Okay. So, but you can keep it for a year in the refrigerator and, you know, you can make a jar of stuff that'll be, you know, about this much ink, a half a jar, mayonnaise jar, keep it in a glass jar in the refrigerator. It'll last you for ages. Muriel, you are muted. Muriel, you're muted. Yoo-hoo. Muted. There we go. There. Hi, Muriel. To follow up on Celinda's question about the papers. Yes. So when you go to uh, Japan and you're selecting papers from the wonderful paper store, what are the qualities or the sensations that you use to pick out? So it's from Japan. I'm in Japan. 800 years. Um, sorry, Mir sorry, Muriel, we haven't uh, heard you because someone was unmuted. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. Well, I, I think I got it. She was asking about what are the qualities of the paper that I would pick out. 
uh, I I like a paper. Sometimes I like a paper that is not going to bleed too much, and other times I really like a bleeding paper because I want to hold a batch of really lot of water in the ink so that I get, you know, a gray and black and it's going to work, work around. So I'm, you know, I will ask them about how it's going to behave and they'll work with you and tell you, but those, you know, that's, that's the kind of paper I like that, you know, and it's strong enough to hold a lot of ink. Thank you. Uh, Can I say something? Mm -hmm. Hello? Yes, yes. I, Go ahead. Yeah. I actually brought uh, the papers I use and I have, and uh, this time in November and in Japan, and to the factory and, uh, you know, the stores. And oh, okay. uh, they carry most uh, half of those ones, and they actually have. It's uh, similar like the mines. I bring my Pima paper. Yunlong paper and the red star paper. They have extremely also expensive red star paper I, I have, but uh, I show them uh, the uh, the Pima paper and the Yunlong paper and the one of the green line, they all love it. And uh, I bought uh, some of those paper from Japan and uh, just like the Pima paper and the Yunlong paper, cloudy dragon, uh, in almost like a shikishi paper. Okay. I have so yeah, and where is uh, your shop? Where is your I, shop? It's in, in the uh, uh, not Lokoko, it's a uh, oh gosh, it's in Tokyo and uh, Tokyo. The gosh, what's the I only write the characters, I don't know the how to pronounce it. It's not Loponko and uh, yeah, Lyogo, Lyogo. Uh, 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 yeah, it's near the museum. It's also near, very near the uh, 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 the Hokkaido, uh, the what's uh, the Hokkaido, the the, uh, the painter actually had the show here. You know, the museum over there. Uh, okay. So yeah, I also practice for making you know the paper over there, and we talk and uh, made a little bit of commotion, and I did a little bit demo on my paper on their papers. So we got some very similar one, and then they have some half of their paper collection, and it's uh, more mostly also from the China's one. But you know, and like uh, I think like uh, Edo said, and I show them the half semis mostly, the Pima paper and the Yunlong paper. It's a semi absorbent. It's it can take a lot of ink and abuse, but they still bleeds, and 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 then some of the. The two paper I use a lot, it's a green line on the long fiber. They really also like the uh, similarity and they give me some of the paper uh, to use. It's the one I have, it's called the green line. So uh, oh, the long take fiber. A visit yeah. to your shop. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank just you let, let you know. know. Yeah, so yeah, so I think they, they you know, had a fun and they also have a lot of machine made, of course, but I specify, I said, I want handmade. I don't like just the machine made, you know, for the sheet. So yeah, I can also finding the store name and probably later on give to Alice or someone and Very can good. post it. Yeah, that so. would be great. Okay, that would be yeah, great. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah, thank you. You, you mean is this paper on your website? Or are you going to sell this paper? Yes, on uh, I, I have two still some left. Uh, just tell you guys, I'm not promoting anything myself. <laughs> but I just to say, I'm not going to, after I have all gone the materials, I probably not uh, going to have more comes in. You know, you, you some people know I'm already transitioning out. And uh, actually today I was able to join the meeting lucky and I'm helping my mother and I just a minute ago and I come back and <laughs> so she, no. So anyway, so yes, it's a Paragon art. If you want looking, it's a Pima paper and a Yunlong paper, so. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank, thank you thank very you. much. Okay, yeah. Are there any other questions from anyone? Yeah, I was just uh, wondering, is there a big difference between Japanese and Chinese papers? I, For me, yes. Uh, of those papers that I have experienced, mm -hmm. uh, for me, they, they're quite different. Uh, Maybe there's more cotton or some something more texture in the Japanese papers. Um, so, 
for me, I prefer a Japanese paper. So I, I see them, they resolve quite differently. Okay, thank you. You try them out and, you know, use them for different things perhaps, but yeah. Yeah, that would be fun. Okay, well, I think that concludes our program. Thank uh, you so much. It was very lovely thank to meet with so you. Much. I hope that I will come and see you again. Uh, I, I met you all at Fumi's uh, memorial service, and I loved seeing your paintings also in that show. And so um, hope to come and see you again sometime for something that's happening. So thank you. Thank you very thank much. You, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. much. Thank, thank you, you very it. much. All righty. Please do come and see us again. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Thank Take care. You. So that concludes our meeting for today. Thank, Thank you, you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you all.